Okay, great. Today is June 17th, 2008. We're sitting in the office of Ed Van Jernan in Moments, Illinois, um, for the Oral History of Illinois Agriculture Project. How are you doing today, Ed? Very good. Thank great. you. Great. Um, I'm going to ask you some real easy questions first. Oh, that's All good. Right. We'll get you warmed up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. So uh, how about um, age, date of birth, and where you were born? I'm 72, uh, May 20, 1936, and born in South Holland, Illinois. In South Holland, Illinois. Um, now, is that were were most of your family living around that area at that time? Or? Yes, right. So, uh, yeah, originally my great grandfather was from Holland, and uh, so I'm fourth generation in this country. Uh, so they moved to that area when they came from Holland. So then how did they get to here in moments? Uh, we farmed in South Holland and as it uh, became a suburban town, uh, the farm moved further south. So we started farming here in moments when I was out of college. So we moved really from uh, truck farming or vegetable farming in South Holland to moments. Okay, okay. Um, now you said your your grandparents came from where again? From Holland, right? And did they come directly to Illinois, or yes, right? Really? Mm -hmm. Wow. Do you have any memories of no I, why they came? Oh, why? Yeah. Uh, not really. Just that uh, probably there were people immigrating into America at that time from other countries also. So there was a lot of more immigration, I think, from European countries in those years. Now, do you think it was a natural progression for them to just go into agriculture? I kind of think so, yes. Interesting. Right. So, you grew up in South Holland with your immediate family around. That would be your parents, grandparents, mm -hmm. any aunts and uncles? Yes, I had an uncle uh, and I had, uh, who farmed with me when my father retired. Or he was 17 years older than my uncle. And uh, he had nephritis or kidney problems, and uh, he retired fairly young because of his health. So I began farming with my uncle, who was 17 years older than I was, and he was 17 years younger than my father. So he was in between. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of how it went. Now, did you have any other uncles or aunts in the area? Or? I had an aunt, too, okay. right. Do you have any memories of her? Yes. Right. Uh, she lived in, also in South Holland. Uh, her husband had died uh, quite young, so she had. Uh, I had cousins from that side of the family, and uh, which I grew up with in a way. Um, so yeah, there's I had all good memories of family. Hmm. So, I mean, you mentioned that your your cousins and your aunt and your uncle. Um, can, you, can we talk a little bit about your childhood in, in South Holland and how it was growing up on the farm? Right. So it was a, a vegetable farm. Where we had cows and horses, uh, two, uh, one cow, two horses usually. So when I grew up, we were still farming with horses. Uh, it was just tractors were just coming in, so we also had some tractors. Uh, my uncle and father were... Um, produce farmers, they grew mainly onion sets, which were planted for gardens and for seed. Um, so they would harvest them in the fall, and they were stored over the winter and then sold in the spring for uh, onion sets, set out onions. So that was their main crop, but we also grew some sugar beets, uh, tomatoes were grown in the area, uh, red beets. Uh, when I was young, we you know, I had hay and so on for cattle, the, the horses and the cows. That they had some hay farming, so it was uh, produce grown also for the Chicago market, uh, South Water Market. Uh, things were grown for. So my grandpa would go to to market with things. They grew some potatoes at that time. Uh, so it was vegetable farming for the people in Chicago mainly when I grew up, and the onion set business. Interesting. Um, so now being a child on the farm, I'm sure you had chores. Right. 
So we had, yeah, you know, we had chickens, and I had to feed the chickens in the morning and get the eggs at night. Uh, we had to do some feed the horses and the cows. You know, there was one cow, so my mother, my father always milked the cow in the morning and evening. Uh, other than that, uh, we used to had some couple other cattle, some steers for we butchered for for meat. Uh, that, that was about the animals that we had. So it wasn't a, a lot of uh, animals, but there were dogs and cats and, and chickens and uh, pretty well uh, typical farm in a way at that time. So you had plenty of pets. Yes, <laughs> right. right. So what were some of your favorite chores then? Uh, yeah, we had, we had, it was our job was to take care of the chickens. We had to get the eggs out. Okay. And uh, we had more eggs than we used in the family, so we sold some eggs. We had to pack them in, you know, in cartons or bags, and uh, people could come and get them. Uh, we sold some milk. We had more milk again than we needed, but not that much. Mm. And I had to work in the fields, so uh, in the summer we weeded. So it was a number of kids, you see, cousins, weeded the fields and worked in the field. Harvesting onion sets was a dirty job, dusty, and we had to help with that. Uh, some of it was done by hand yet first, and as it, later on it was more mechanized. They had harvesters. But onion sets were stored in crates. They were put in crates in the uh, warehouse. They came into the warehouse and stored in the warehouse. But they had to be cleaned and sorted and so on too. So that was done some of it in the winter, and we had to help with that too. What was the one chore that you just did not want to do? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I can't really say. Uh, we had to clean the barn, some you know manure. We had to clean out the stalls, and mm -hmm. it wasn't particularly light. And same thing with the chicken coops had to be cleaned. Every so often, every two, three months, we had to clean the chicken coop and put new straw in and so on. Um, now, you mentioned a lot about your cousins already being around. What about any other friends? Did you have a lot of other friends around the farm and playing? Yeah, there was, you know, there were neighbor kids around. So, yeah, we played ball in, in the pasture. And uh, so they came over quite a bit or we went there. Uh, they weren't really close. They were, you know, in our compared to now, where people live close. This was a quarter mile away. So, but that wasn't, you know, no problem walking or taking your bike and seeing other kids in the area. Now you mentioned playing ball. What other games did you play? Uh, baseball and football. Where we played softball, 12-inch softball mostly, but football. Uh, not much soccer then, but that those are the really the mostly is twelve inch softball and football. What positions? Uh, I used to pitch mainly and some, uh, but all positions. So when we when you played out in the pasture, you just kind of rotated around. So you'd get five or six kids and play ball. So when we got older and played in school and, and so on, then you know I had regular teams and so on. But mm. we were just kids. It was just whoever you can get together and play. <laughs> Great. Um, now, I mean, now they have 4-H and FFA programs and organizations. Did you have any organizations like that when you were in school? No, I wouldn't say so. No, not that I know of. So farm work, we could kind of say, was seen more as farm work and not a right. thing to learn about. So most of your learning was done on the farm. Right. Um, do you have memories of learning about farm activities with your father or having him show you things? Yeah, but you learn probably more by experience by just doing it. You were, uh, you were working, really. So, we, you know, I started working on the farm when I was in seventh, eighth grade in school. Oh, really? Right. So we really kind of worked all summer. Uh, I would say starting about the sixth or seventh grade. Now, how many um, brothers and sisters did you have? 
I had one brother who was two years older, and my sister uh, was four years younger. Um, now, did your brother work on the farm with you as well? Right. Mm -hmm. And how about your sister? She did too, yeah. Were there... I, I don't think as much, maybe, as my brother and I. But girls, you know, worked around the house more, maybe not in, where we were had to work in the field. Mm -hmm. So, a little bit different, yeah. Um, what about, what about church? Was church really involved? In yes, we, are, we were very active in church. We didn't work on Sundays. There was really no Sunday work. Uh, and pretty much everybody in the community went to church on Sunday. So we belonged to a, what was Christian Reformed Church. And uh, we went usually twice a Sunday. When I was little, they also had services in the afternoon, which were in Dutch. We still uh, had Dutch services when I was real small. So I can remember going to Dutch service, too. Really? Uh -huh. So do you, um, were you able to understand the Dutch? No, very little. My grandpa, who was born in this country, uh, he spoke a lot of, you know, Dutch quite a bit. Uh, so I learned a little from him. And my mother and father could speak Dutch well. But no, I never really learned it very well. Not really at all, really. Just know a few words. Interesting. Um, what other kinds of Dutch customs would you say that your family has in comparison to some of the neighbors and everybody else around? Probably not too much when I was growing up. We were pretty well Americanized. Um, we went to a private school, Christian school. And it was a Dutch community, so many of the, uh, was many Dutch people. Uh, Cultural-wise, uh, you know, there was things that probably we ate that were uh, Dutch from a Dutch background, but otherwise, not much. We were pretty well Americanized, and I would say hmm. that there was a lot. Uh, every ethnic group, you know, if you're Italian or Polish or German, has some distinctive things, and the same with the Dutch community, but not not that we weren't uh, pretty much, you know, if you know the, the language and you, everybody speaks English, and so we were really Americanized. Um, so, you know, you said you went to a private school, did you, where, where did you go to school, first of all? Uh, there was a school in South Holland, and we lived a mile out of town, just on the edge of town. Good mile, mile, maybe, yeah, little, well, about a mile. So the school was about a mile away, a good mile away. Okay. So we went to school there, and it was right in town, the school was. Um, now, we're, now there were town kids and country kids going to the same school. Mm -hmm. Do you remember any kind of, you know, conflicts between country and town kids, or? No, really not at all. There was just no difference between? Mm -mm, not really, no. It was a farming community, but there was, you know, a lot of kids that lived in town. Some of their parents worked in factories and so on around in the area. Uh, Harvey was a close, which is a manufacturing town. There was a lot of industry in Harvey, and some people worked there. But there was also carpenters and plumbers and uh, so all different kind of trade backgrounds kids mm -hmm. came from too. So it was um, on the edge of the suburbs of Chicago. It was a farming community on the edge of Chicago, metropolitan Chicago. So yeah, we're 30 miles south of Chicago, so it wasn't that far from the city. And same thing, uh, there there was. Uh, farm produce sold to Chicago and so on too. Now you mentioned before your grandfather going in to sell at the markets in Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any any memories of going into Chicago to sell at the markets? Some I did. You know, when I got you know, uh, we'd go to the South Water Market and take some uh, products there. Particularly when I started farming, uh, we raised chives and we potted chives and we took potted chives to Chicago. Onion sets were sold at the markets in Chicago, South Water Market. So I remember you know, going there with uh, produce, some. Um, my grandfather would go with the horse and wagon, 
they would go and they they would quite often leave in the afternoon and then he would sleep overnight in a tavern and uh, then they would have the produce in the market early in the morning and come back the, the next day so that was a two-day trip to Chicago at that time when he used to tell me about that huh. that's cool um, so for somebody who's never been to the market in Chicago can you explain what it's like uh, yeah, markets are very busy. You know, they open usually uh, two, three in the morning. South Water Market did. Uh, there is a lot of produce coming in. When I was young, that mostly came in by truck, some by by rail. But the rail cars were loaded, unloaded a ways away. So uh, from all over the country, produce would come in, and the buyers would be there from restaurants and stores. And uh, most of the produce was handled through South Water Market for the city of Chicago for a long time. And it was very, very busy. Particularly when trucks started to come in, it was, had been built really for the horse and buggy age. And when semis started coming in, it was very crowded and very congested. And a very inter interesting place for young kids. <laughs> <laughs> so, um,. Who set the prices then? You know, they were just that was a free market. You know, whatever the uh, the prices varied a great deal on Chicago market. If anything was short, the price went up very quickly, and if it was oversupply, it went down very quickly. So it was a free market, really. So prices were adjusted rapidly. Huh. Now, did your family? Did or does your family have friends that are in the Chicago market mm -hmm. from then that, you know? We did. We had some that we knew that worked on the market. Um, so, yeah, they weren't close friends, but, we, you know, they had good acquaintance with some of them. We had some, uh, we sold potatoes in the fall of the year where people would store potatoes in their basement for the winter. Mostly they came from Idaho and North Dakota. And uh, my parents, uh, my uncle and my father, had a business in uh, selling potatoes in the fall. They were bought by a train. They'd come in by train car loads, and you, we'd buy the car of potatoes, and it would uh, come into South Holland. They would unload them and sell them to local people. And people would store potatoes for the winter in their cellars. So in the fall, usually in October for a month, we would sell potatoes. And then we, they, they would, my uncle and my father would go to market every day and, and look at carloads of potatoes that were coming in and uh, buy them. And it was up to 20 carloads of potatoes they would sell in the fall. So we used to go to the potato market and uh, in the morning and uh, you'd have to get up at 2 o'clock if you wanted to go along. And, uh, they would go into in the cars of potatoes and inspect the potatoes, and then it would be a you know, bartering on the price. Really, it was a, if you decided what car of potatoes you were interested in, then you bartered on the price with the, on the potato market. Now, um, I'm sure your father and your grandfather were going off to the market, and they were selling all their product. Were they ever bringing any kind of special things or different things back from the market? Yes, yeah, some. You know, when you were at market, you know, they would buy a box of grapes or peaches or apples. So there was a lot of, we always had a lot of fruits and vegetables because when they went to market, they would take things back. How often were they going to market then? Um, when I was growing up, not that, not every day, but... Um, they would go a few times a week, probably. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's very interesting. Now, when did you really start taking over the farm from your father? I went to college. I went to the University of Illinois. Uh, first, I went one year to uh, college in Michigan, Calvin College, and then to the University of Illinois. I took agriculture. Uh, horticulture, really. So I had planned on going into the nursery business. So I, I 
studied uh, really for horticulture at the University of Illinois. Uh, when I came out of school, uh, I went on one year to got my master's degree in horticulture. And then I came home and I started farming with my uncle. And I, we, we, I had planned to go into the nursery business and we planted some nursery stock, but I also took over the onion set farming that my father retired from at the same time, um, which we grew some nursery stock and we were doing uh, the vegetable farming, onion set farming also. As uh, at that same time, we started growing some chives, which was uh, for a farmer in uh, Florida who was potting chives and growing chives in Florida. And he, they wouldn't overwinter in Florida because it was, or over summer, they wouldn't go through the summer because it was too hot. So they would buy chive roots and we were shipping them to Florida and he was planting them out uh, for the winter crop of chives. Uh, that's when we started harvesting some of our own chives, and taking them to market, potting them, taking them to market, and also we were freezing them or dairy industry where they were using them in cottage cheese. That's really how we started in the herb business. And uh, it got, so we had to decide, you know, whether we were gonna stay in the herb business and farming or go in the nursery business. So we were doing both for a while, but we dropped really the nursery business and went into the herb business. As we raised uh, more and more herbs and the main crop was chives first. Uh, we started selling them frozen first and also the fresh market. And then we started freeze drying them. Freeze drying chives was just beginning and we were shipping them out to be freeze dried. And uh, it was a dried product then, which was sold to spice companies and dairies and other food manufacturers. And from there we started uh, getting our own dryers. Once we had our own dryers, then we started doing more uh, herbs, but also we started uh, drying other fruits and vegetables, which we purchased, usually frozen. So the business grew from there. And once we started doing our own drying, it grew you know, fairly rapidly, and particularly we got into other fruits and vegetables. What year would you say you kind of made that decision, we're going to go strictly to um, growing herbs? Um, I would say around 1965, right in there. So it was kind of a transition for over a number of years there. So we phased out of the, of the nursery business, which we had started, and uh, went in more and more to, you know, also we dropped the onion, growing onion sets maybe 10 years later. Um, we grew a uh, few other vegetable crops, we had cabbage and so on for a while, but slowly on we got out of the vegetable crops and into the herbs, so we're, we ended up growing just the herbs and really no other vegetable crops. So now what did you do for the nursery business? What were you growing in the nursery business exactly? That was trees and shrubs, uh, evergreens, which we sold um, to other landscapers mainly. And uh, so we had built that up somewhat. We also purchased some other uh, nursery, uh, bald and burlap uh, nursery products that we sold the landscapers. So we did some of that uh, also. So we phased out of that too after a while. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, you, you kind of gave us a picture of your father's farm which was very diverse with lots of livestock mm -hmm. and some, some different crops and things like that. Can you give us kind of a picture of what the farm looks like now? Uh, now we're just growing just herbs, uh, almost all the culinary herbs, thyme and oregano and basil, cilantro, growing some onion tops, uh, dill, uh, mint, uh, uh, oregano, did I say? Maybe I said oregano. Um, so really all the culinary herbs that are used for cooking. Mm. 
uh, we're freezing them and we're selling some frozen and we're drying them. We're selling some freeze dried. Uh, also some air dried, but not, that's minor. So it's mostly frozen and freeze dried. And those are big fields. We're farming uh, about a thousand acres. Uh, they're harvested all summer and we have to put up enough to supply customers uh, year round. So we store enough to carry us through the winter for the supply and customers. Um, m most of those are harvested a number of times, two or three times. Uh, cilantro is usually harvested in the, twice in the spring and twice in the fall. Basil will be harvested six, seven times during the summer. So uh, even though it's a uh, thousand acres, it's more than a thousand acres that are harvested uh, because there are multiple harvests on uh, most all the herbs. So you have a thousand acres. That's and where where is the thousand acres from here? I mean, is it they're all right, one plot or? right? They're all within ten miles. So we're farming uh, four or five places within a ten mile radius. Mm -hmm. So most of it's closer than that, but that's the farthest out. Now your father's place wasn't that large, so kind of over time you've accumulated all this land that you're farming now. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what was that process? Um, we still rent some, um, but most of it we're farming our own ground. So that's slowly over the time we, we purchased some ground and added to it. And uh, uh, most of it's irrigated, so we have most of it out of wells. Some out of the Kankakee River, but most of it out of uh, wells. Uh, because it's uh, high-valued crops, it's in, kind of important to irrigate so you don't lose crops. Now, your father's type of farming was completely different than herb farming. What did, you know, what were some of his comments about going into the herb business and things like that? It was somewhat different, but onion set farming was specialized farming in a way, so it was a specialized crop uh, more than most others. So, and herbs are a specialized crop. So some ways they were different, but uh, some ways they were similar too in, in that sense that uh, both of them are, what we're doing is, is pretty specialized crops. Uh, his comments, uh, he died uh, really uh, before we were, we were just going into the herb business in a way when, when he died. Uh, so he was, you know, he, he encouraged me to, to do it. So he was encouraging about a lot of it. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, would you go to him for advice about, you know, this is something I'm looking into, Dad. What do you think? Did you? Yeah, some. Uh, again, he he um, was 62 when he died, so mm -hmm. he wasn't that old. Uh, so he was more active in my younger life than when I started the transition really into the herb farming. Now, um, you also mentioned that you have an older brother. Mm -hmm. Is he involved in the farm, or was he involved in the farm? Or? No, he, he was when he grew up with me. Yeah. Uh, he became a dentist. He went to dental school, and so he was a dentist. So, no, he wasn't uh, active in the farming other, after he went to college. Now, was it kind of an idea that one of the sons in your family was going to be on, on the farm, you know, for your father? was? Uh, not necessarily. I think our father uh, somewhat encouraged it, but not, no, there was no pressure at all to go into farming. Uh, so he left that pretty well up to us. Same thing with my brother. So it would have been fine with him if he wanted to farm, I think, but no, there was no pressure on either one of us to, to farm either. Now, why, I mean, here your brother went into dentistry. Why, why did you go into farming? <laughs> it's a big question. That's a big question, yeah. I, I don't know, really. I liked it, I guess, but uh, no particular reason otherwise. But I, I chose to go into agriculture, where he didn't, so. Um, now, you, you did mention that you do have a very specialized crop that you're growing. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and I'd like to talk a little bit more about that. And first of all, what does it take to grow herbs? You know, I mean, are there special machinery that, that's involved? Or? There are, so it's mostly all mechanically harvested. When we first began chives, it was maybe almost, it was all hand harvested. Uh, so it was quite labor intensive, and it still is. But now it's all mechanically harvested, and so we made machinery that would harvest uh, chives and other herbs. Uh, so it's become much more mechanized than it was then. So as a time, yeah, the, the machinery grew with the uh, processing and harvesting. So it's quite a bit harvested, quite a bit different, where it was all hand harvested at one time. Um, so what types of, what, what exactly are the machines that you're using to harvest? Uh, basically, there's two. There's a there's a, a machine that cuts chives, which just takes one row at a time and cuts them off uh, at the circular blades that cut them off of the ground, and then they they go up a belt and onto they're taken and laid into boxes where they used to be cut by a knife by hand and laid into boxes. Uh, the other machine is is a sickle machine that uh, cuts the herbs off just above the ground. Uh, these are for basil and thyme and oregano and uh, cilantro. It's almost all the other herbs are cut with a sickle, and they are, go on a belt. And a belt goes, puts them in, a, takes them, and puts them in a wagon. So they're they're harvested in wagons, and the wagons are pulled in from the field, and then they're they're unloaded and they're washed, and uh, go through cutters usually, and they're frozen. Uh, and then boxed up and then or go into trays and they go into the dryers where they're freeze dryers. So some of them are freeze dried, some of them are sold frozen. So we sell uh, quite a bit of frozen as well as dried. Frozen are used in uh, where they use a wet mix like they use basil and spaghetti and they'll use uh, cilantro and salsas uh, for tomato salsas and, and Spanish or Mexican food are used a lot. Uh, dried are used for spice companies where they'll you know, bottle it and for dried spices. So freeze drying is a better way of dehydrating or drying than uh, air drying or dehydrating. It's a little better quality product, but it's more expensive also. So it, it's a higher end of the, of the dried market. Um. Now let's talk, do you, do you have to rotate these crops or? Right, we try to, yeah. So usually a field will, will uh, some are annuals, thyme and uh, tarragon and oregano are, are perennials that come up every year, chives. So some are perennials that come up every year. The, other, the others are annuals that are planted every year, basil, dill, thyme, I don't know, not thyme, but uh, cilantro are annual crops and they're grown as annuals. Uh, the perennials we try to rotate every four or five years. The annuals we try to rotate every year, you know, so we'll put a different crop on wherever we can. Now do you have to use a fertilizer? Yes, we fertilize. Um, because these are leafy crops they take quite a bit of nitrogen. Uh, but yeah, we fertilize regular, we test the soil and Try to add whatever we need to grow a crop well. Um, who who's doing the testing of the soil? Are you doing it particularly here, or we take the samples and send them into a soil lab that tests them. Okay. Um, now I'm sure with all the fertilizer and everything else that the herbs aren't the only things growing. There's got to be quite a few weeds out there. Right. Um, how are you dealing with the weeds? Uh, weeds are always a problem, <laughs> particularly in vegetable crops. So we do quite a bit of hand weeding. Um, we're also using some herbicides. They're restricted on uh, minor crops because they, many uh, herbicides aren't approved uh, for minor crops where they are for, for major crops. 
but slowly on there's more and more of them being approved, but that's a long process. So we're fairly restricted on what we can use. We have to stay within uh, the approved herbicides that have been approved for herbs. Uh, and that isn't a whole lot. And there was for a while, there was hardly any, but now there's a few more as they, um, see there was herbicides approved for onions, but they might not be approved for chives, even though they're very similar. But it takes the research and the chemical companies have to do the research to get them uh, FDA approved, and that takes time and it's expensive. So uh, where there's a lot of herbicides, or quite a few more, at least for major crops than there are for minor crops. So that's a one of the problems mm -hmm. with minor crops. Are there crops. any other differences between major and minor crops like like this with the herbicides? Or? Uh, again, there's less research probably on being done for minor crops. Um, and they're more labor intense, but otherwise, uh, and growing somewhat different, but, um, and your marketing's quite a bit different. We're selling to food manufacturers mainly, so it's, sell, it's wholesale but there we have to call on our customers directly so we call on most all the major food companies and sell them frozen and dried uh, uh, herbs and other products so we're also doing uh, <coughs> most all the fruits and vegetables so that grew as the business grew we've covered other crops so that's other than that's a little different than the farming side of the business although it's the same customers many times. Uh, the herbs and were growing, uh, the fruits and vegetables were buying and drying them. Mm. Now, uh, as you said, your customers are a little different. Who, who are some of your customers? Uh, Kraft and McCormick and Uncle Ben's and uh, a lot of uh, bakeries, uh, cereal companies. Uh, so just about everybody in the food industry, people that are making pizzas and uh, almost all uh, processed food companies, which are all the major food companies. Now, I mean, let's say somebody owned a bakery or you know some kind of food company, and they wanted to purchase your your product. How do they get to do that? We have about six or seven people that are selling that are calling on major companies. Uh, they, you know, were listed as uh, ingredient suppliers, so people will call us too for ingredients that they want. So it works kind of both ways, some through getting your name known, food shows, we, we go to food shows, and uh, uh, so you try to get uh, to know the buyers of major companies. And some through research, you know, you work with the research people in uh, major companies. That, uh, get to supply them with samples and so on so they will look at your products. Hmm. Interesting. Um, to kind of come back to the crops that you're growing, what about insects? I'm sure, I mean, herbs taste good, right. <laughs> not just to us. So how, you know, how are you dealing with, with insects and things? Uh, insects aren't a big problem in herb crops. Uh, really? Less probably than a lot of other vegetable and fruit and vegetable crops. Um, since there aren't really any her or insecticides approved or very little for minor crops, we do really very little or almost really no uh, spraying for insecticides. Um, we do get some bugs in and we, we in the cleaning and the, in the washing and so on, we can get most of the insects out of the food product, which so food companies are very fussy nowadays about insects in their uh, products. So they don't want any. So we have to be very careful we don't get any insects in our uh, herbs we're selling. So we, they go through a tumbler, which uh, the, the screen tumbler, which insects fall out of. So we clean most of them out that way. So, uh, and in the crop itself, uh, insects aren't a big problem in herbs. So that's that's one of the benefits of herbs. Insects aren't uh, <laughs> uh, 
Weeds are a much bigger problem than insects. We have some problem, but it's it's not a major uh, problem. So we and we really do know spraying for insects. Huh. What what types of insects are you trying to get rid of when you're washing and tumbling all these all these herbs? Exactly what? Some of them are, are good insects, like ladybugs and so on. People don't like ladybugs, <laughs> even though they're they're eating other insects. Uh, there's there's some spiders. There's ladybugs. There's grasshoppers. Uh, so, uh, just a regular garden. There's some uh, thrip and aphids. Uh, they're, they're, but they're 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 minor in in herb crops. For us, so we don't have a whole lot of insect problems. Weed problems are much worse. We are growing some organic. Uh, about 25 percent of what we grow is organic. And what's organic, we can't use uh, fertilizer, insecticides, or pesticides on that at all. Um, so we have to deal with uh, growing stuff organically, or we're able to anyway. Yeah. So we do grow some organic. How did you come to that decision of growing things, some of your crop organic? Uh, partly it was because you weren't allowed to use, or there were no approved insecticides or herbicides for herbs. Um, so we partly did it that, for that reason. Uh, we thought if we can't use anything anyway. The problem we really run into mainly with the organic is um, fertilizers. Very little fertilizer you can use. You can't use any chemical fertilizers, so it becomes more and more difficult to farm without any fertilizer. We used to use some manure, but it's been much more restrictive on using manure. Uh, your organic people don't want you to use what they call factory manure that comes out of a uh, chicken farm or a pig farm. So natural manure is very limited. That, um, so there really is very little fertilizer in the organic industry right now. And so that, the biggest problem with growing organically is the lack of fertilizer. And it's it's a serious problem, I think, for organic growers if the, um, because they have really no good source of fertilizer. And it's difficult, particularly on vet, on herb crops, to grow without nitrogen because they're leafy products. But it would it is difficult in all herb crops or all crops really because of the lack of fertilizer in organics. So it's a big restriction on the organic business. I think is. Uh, Lack of fertilizer, no good fertilizer for us. There was a time when there was, everybody had cows and horses and everybody had some fertilizer. But nowadays, uh, they're just large chicken, there's large dairy farms and large hog farms. And if you can't use the fertilizer from those, the manure from those, you're restricted on what you can use. Mm. Huh. That's got to be. Kind of frustrating. <laughs> well, that's uh, one of the problems. A lot of, there's a lot of interest in organic growing, uh, and uh, I think there's problems with the, the problem with the industry is people mainly are, don't want to use uh, the chemicals. They're worried about the chemical part of it, um, but the, by restricting the use of fertilizer that there is no really a good source of fertilizer anymore. It's going to hurt the organic industry and I don't see any way how they're going to get around that issue. Because if uh, the, the problem is on factory farms, they're mostly using chemicals and so on. And so most of the chicken farmers are using some uh, non-organic products and growing. Same thing with hog, dairy farms, and all those. So it's a it's a major problem with for organics, I think, which somewhere they have to deal with, but I don't know how they're going to. Hmm. It'll be interesting to see. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it will. Um, now, it, it seems like this is a very fitting question, being on timing with all the floods that are going on around. How how about drainage on your land? Do you have problems with 
some. <laughs> uh, we just had close to six inches of rain here, uh, so we lost some crop, uh, maybe 20% uh, of the fields got drowned out, so it, it's pretty severe right in our area. Um, and we had crops that were ready to harvest, so it wasn't uh, the best time right now for uh, growing. And it was a very, it's an unusually heavy rain we had in this area. Uh, you don't get a six inch rain very often, so it's, it's unusual. And the ditches and everything else filled up, so it was hard to get the water off and so on. So um, it's one of the problems with farming, you, you deal with the weather. Yeah. It's either too dry or too wet. But <laughs> <laughs> um, so do you have tiling? Or? Some, we have some fields that have some tile. Uh, some, have, you know, ditches and uh, it just uh, normally, in a normal year, we, we're, we're in good shape for drainage. That's when you get an unusual rain or unusual year, which doesn't happen that often. But we just have to go through one just now because of the heavy rain. Yeah. So, you know, you just had this heavy rain and you lost a good, a good chunk of your, your crop. What are you, um, how are you planning to deal with that? Uh, we replant, so you know, because we're planting really all year, all summer round, um, we'll plant crops. So we'll compensate somewhat by replanting, and we're replanting fields. But we just lose, as I said, we harvest most crops six, seven times. So we lost one harvest, or would say, or two harvests on it. So uh, we can make a lot of that up. Uh, so it somewhat it's difficult, but it's not uh, you know, unsolvable in a way. Okay. Um, now you've kind of explained that you're you're bringing these crops in, you chop them up, and you you know kind of clean them off, and then you're freeze drying them, or um, you mentioned a little bit about air drying. Well, I'm wondering if you could kind of talk a little bit about the storage process. Okay. Uh, once it's dried, it'll keep probably for about a year, you know, shelf life is at least a year, a little longer, but right around a year. We try not to keep anything over a year. Um, so it's dried, it can, it's dried storage. So we have a big warehouse where we can store and ship out of. Frozen, it's the same way, but that has to go into, into frozen storage. Uh, we sell it, we, we store it in a, in a local frozen food storage facility and it's shipped out of there frozen or out of the, our own warehouse here as dried so we're shipping uh, out uh, this building for uh, dried and uh, the frozen warehouse for frozen. Where is um, the frozen warehouse? Is that, where is that located? That's uh, about five miles away so that's just stored there and it uh, they, they fill the orders there. A lot of it goes out by truckloads, uh, some smaller, less than truckloads. Uh, dried, say it's the same, a lot of it goes out by truckloads. Some of that also goes by smaller. We spelt like uh, the bakeries will, will order smaller quantities, some even United Parcel if they're for small orders. Um, so shipping is... Uh, number of different ways and What's so we the, ship every day oh wow okay so there's quite a bit of product goes out every day what's a large shipment our truck load is 40,000 pounds so uh, that's about as large as you know usually people don't order more than a truck load at a time but that that's that's quite common though so what is the I mean it's probably hard to put a number on, but what, how, how much product are you producing out of here? Of herbs, we're uh, producing 10 million pounds, so it, it's a lot. Uh, and part of that is, or a big part of it's fro frozen, but also dried. Uh, so when I say 10 million pounds, that's frozen pounds. 
So, you know, that's a considerable amount of truckloads. Plus, we're also doing the other herbs, uh, not herbs, but fruits and vegetables, which we're buying. So, there's a, it's maybe of the, one of our sales now, herbs are maybe 20%, and uh, the other fruits and vegetables are probably 80%. Now, where are you purchasing the other fruits and vegetables from? Pretty well all over. So it depends where they're grown. We'll uh, get strawberries from California a lot, but also from Chile and Poland. Uh, raspberries, same thing. Uh, corn and peas are a lot of it from Oregon and Washington, a lot from California. Blueberries, a lot from Michigan some from the Northwest. Uh, so it depends where they're growing it. So we'll buy it, usually frozen from wherever the frozen packers are that are packing it. So broccoli and spinach and uh, are grown in different areas, different times of the year. So wherever it's grown, really. Mm -hmm. So our, our, it's fairly broad that we're... Yeah, now some starting. of the international crops that you're getting in, that's got to be kind of difficult to get it into the United States. Mm -hmm. Somewhat. Um, What's the process for doing that? You really have to buy them internationally, and you know they have to go. They come in in containers, usually you know frozen. It, we're buying a lot of frozen, so it has to go through your inspections in port. It takes a time to to get it here, so there's there's lead times. Sometimes they're fairly long if they're coming from other countries. Uh, so. Inspections have become uh, more numerous, and so it's a lot of crops that are brought in are inspected. Um, so it takes, they are held up in port longer than they used to be. So it, it's a longer time frame to get them here sometimes. Is that making it more difficult for you to do your job? Is it? A little bit, yeah. So it, it's just a time issue. You have to figure more time to get product in from other countries. Now, how are you deciding, I want to freeze-dry strawberries over freeze-dry peas? I mean, how are you making these decisions on what you're going to do? Depends on, on orders and customers. We try to get an idea of what a customer is going to use and lead time and so on. So as we dry products, uh, you try to Inventory is a problem, so it, it's a big job keeping inventories re in reasonable in line of what customers are going to need. Uh, it's expensive to have too much inventory, and customers are very unhappy if you don't have enough inventory. You can't supply them, so that's that's a, uh, a job to keep customers happy and keep your inventory down. Yeah. So how long, let's say? I called up and said I wanted a truckload of peas. How long would it take till I got the truckload of peas? We would have peas on hand, so we oh. have we, so we could ship that out pretty quick. If it was something you didn't have on hand, that would be longer. You know, most fruits and vegetables we carry some inventory, but major like sweet corn and peas we carry fairly large inventories because those are items that we sell a lot of. So. Uh, those we can, but we also have to know what a customer is going to be taking and using. So you try to keep in contact with your customers, and uh, if you can, sometimes we contract that we we contract with them that we know what they're going to use. They say we're going to take so much and so much every month or every couple weeks, and so we try to work with them in a way. So it's a lot of customer relationships there. You know, I'm, I'm noticing that, I mean, you've gone from when you were a child going to the market in Chicago to kind of this international market mm -hmm. and, and this global market. I mean, do you, what are the similarities between the two that you've kind of picked up on? Are there some similarities that just cross boundaries? Um, yeah, it's quite a bit different. Uh, we, we export, too. You know, we're selling people in other countries some, not a lot, but we do some. We do, we're do. we doing some importing, but we're also doing some exporting. Probably about as much of each. Uh, the differences, 
Some things are, people are interested in really three things. They're interested in price and quality and service. And if you have the best price and the best quality and the best service, you'll get all the business. <laughs> but that's very difficult to do. And um, the other side, if you don't have some of those, you'll be out of business, right? So, and that's, when you're small or big, it really works pretty much the same. You have to give people, they're buying from you because of one or all of three of those. They're either buying on price or quality or service. Probably quality and service in the long run are more important than price. And People will first buy on price, but as you go along, they're more interested in quality and service. So those are basically they stay the same if you yeah. so, if you want all the business you'll get all the business if you have all three yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so what do you do to keep up quality and service then? Uh, all our products go through the lab so we're testing them and companies require a lot more uh, quality insurance I would say so they want to see your lab results or know that you have them so you have to test for on a dried product for moisture, for bacteria counts, plate counts. Uh, so each lot that we put up and uh, sell, we uh, we can give spec sheets and tell people what's in it. And uh, so we have about 20 people working in the lab, just doing lab work. Uh, so it's a big job to just to ensure quality. So we try to do the best we can, and the companies are demanding more and more because of lawsuits, and they want to, they just can't take the chance on having uh, defective products. It's too risky for them, so they, they demand more and more service in the quality area. Yeah. No, I'm sure when you started in 1965, you didn't have a, a lab. No. Particularly, when did, I mean, when did that start? Slowly on, we used to send out uh, samples to the lab, uh, uh, food labs, and have things checked. But uh, as you do more and more of it, you have your own lab and you know, have your own uh, quality control. And so that builds up it, as a business build. It, uh, also, the quality part of it uh, grew too. And demands have gotten much much more stringent, I would say, as the food industry has become more conscious of salmonella and uh, E. coli, and uh, so companies can't afford to take any chances on food. So our food is much better than it used to be. You know, our quality of our food is, I think, has gone up a lot, uh, just because it's been demanded by the public and. Uh, it's the same thing with pesticides and herbicides. Most of them, are, our food is very safe, much safer than it was 20, 30 years ago, I think. Because uh, just that wasn't known. We were using pesticides and herbicides. They weren't always the safest, but now they're, they're pretty safe. They're, the control on it is, is very stringent in a way. So uh, our food is very good. We hear now, you know, salmonella outbreaks and E. coli outbreaks. Uh, before, you never heard of them. People just died of it, and everybody, nobody knew it. But now, if somebody dies of it, the whole world knows it. That, that's uh, the changes that have taken place. Hmm. You know, you've mentioned, and kind of on the same line, the you know the FDA right. and and some of the things that they're requiring um, now. The, the quality of your product, is that above FDA standards or at FDA standards? How do you, you know, keep in those lines? Um, most of the, the industry is self-controlled. You know, FDA comes in and checks things and so on, but it's mainly, the FDA is mainly checking when there's problems. They, they do, you know, do a lot of testing on herbicides and pesticides and to make sure they're safe. Uh, those that are approved now are, are pretty safe and you're uh, not allowed to use unsafe ones. So there's a number of them they've taken off the market because they had too much residual effect and too, too um, 
cancer effects and harmful effects. So the ones that are left that we can use, I think, are, are in most cases fairly safe and they've been tested very well. Uh, there's, not, there's no perfect system and uh, the FDA can't know everything either. Nobody can. So, but they do, a, a, I think, a very good job on trying to control quality on fruits and vegetables, and our food products. Um, and while we're on the topic of the FDA, what, how do you feel about, you know, government programs for farming? Um, most of them, I think, are pretty good. Um, sometimes they're, they're over-restrictive and sometimes under, you know, the problem what government has, they, they work after the fact many times when there's an outbreak of something, they come in and change it. It's very hard to anticipate the future, and that's a problem the government has. In some cases they become over-restricted. People say, well, why didn't, wasn't this watch? But you can't predict everything. It's just like we just had a big rainstorm. We said, why didn't we know there was six inches of rain coming? <laughs> uh, hindsight is perfect. But, uh, <laughs> so the government gets blamed for many things that uh, they can't really control. And maybe they try, because of that, they try to control too much, I would almost say. Now, um I noticed you have a, a great, a good-sized family here in, mm -hmm. in the picture behind me. Um, are any of your sons or daughters involved in the farm? Yes, I have two sons that are involved. Uh, I have two daughters and two sons, but the two sons are involved in the business. They take care of most of it. I'm getting to, getting old, and uh, I, I do less. And they're, they're running most of the business now. Okay. Um, now, did they go off to school to... To run this, or I mean, yes, yeah. yeah, they, they both went to college. My oldest son Jeff went to Purdue, and he took food technology. And my younger son Kevin went to Illinois, and he really uh, majored in business. Okay. Um, so, what's the process of turning over? I mean, this is a big operation with a thousand acres, and mm -hmm. you know all the, the the different products that you're producing. What's What's kind of the, how are you going about turning it over to your sons? Um, so I've, I've worked at turning it over for a number of years. So I've, you know, turned over the, the interest in the business to them, which is, takes a considerable lot of work and planning uh, so far. It's, it, they have control of most of the business now. And that takes a number of years, and it's been worked on. So it's important to work on. Uh, many families, and farmer families anyway, don't work on it. It's easy to not work on it. So, and, but it's very important to do. And so I would encourage people, particularly farmers, to work on it, start when they're young, before they get too old. There must be a little bit of pride in, in the fact that your sons are both involved in the business. There is a great deal, right. So, and they've done a very good job, so that makes it easier too. So I have had no problem turning things over to them. Hmm. Now, um, beyond just your sons, there's got to be a lot of people that are working for Vendrian Farms. Mm -hmm. um, how many people are you employing? Uh, probably a little over 300, um, and it varies a little bit. Uh, there's a little more in the summer than in the winter, but not that much. Most of the people work year-round. Uh, we try to keep them busy all year-round. We build equipment and so on in the winter and uh, uh, do repairs and so on. So we try to keep as much of the help as we can that work year-round. Um, that's grown. so. This part in sales and uh, management and so on, those people work year-round. Freeze-drying goes on year-round, so that's a, uh, a steady. Uh, we do in the summer work more hours. You know, the uh, processing part of the herbs we run at night usually, so it runs almost 24 hours. So we're running two, two or three shifts at night 
or during the day, it's a year, a day or all day long. So once we start harvesting, we run 24 hours a day, really. And the freeze dryers run 24 hours a day. So we, we do have people here at night to use it. Now, when you started in 1965, you weren't at around 300 people. How many people did you have working then? Um, again, that was much more seasonal. Um, maybe three or four or five year round, but in the summer you might have 25, 30. Uh, when we, so, so you've really grown quite a bit. Right. Very, very interesting, very good. Um, so, you know, you've mentioned the rain a couple of times, and it's got to be, you know, a really hard part of farming is to put all that work into the fields and money and everything else and watch it just kind of go wa and get washed away. What's the thing that's making you get up every morning and, you know, come into work? and? Well, that's one of the things that's interesting about farming. It's not the same every day. It varies quite a bit. It's, you know, you can get very dry weather, it can be windy, uh, you know, uh, your crop can just be up and you can get a bad windstorm and blow off and things like that. So uh, there's always uh, more difficult than a manufacturing where you have a, a plant. So in a way, freeze drying is much easier to manage than farming is because you don't have the variables that you do in uh, farming. So. Um, you can control things in manufacturing better than you can in farming. Insects, diseases, rain, cold, too hot, too wet. So uh, farming, there's a lot of variables. And it's harder to control. But it also makes it very interesting. So. Well, and i got to ask, with all those variables, why stay in the farming side of it? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, in some ways, uh, uh, the management of farming is is, is uh, a little more difficult than the other. Um, if you can't manage it, you you get out of it. But it also, if you can manage it, there's also opportunities because it is the more difficult things are. A lot of times, the more opportunities there are. It's much easier to grow corn and soybeans than it is to grow herbs. And uh, it, same thing, the, the profitability of difficult things is usually better than if everybody can do it. So that's part of the challenge. Why do it? Because it's probably more profitable. What would you, I mean, to somebody that's starting out in, the, in growing herb, and growing a, and are starting an herb farm, what would you recommend to them? You know, what are some of the first things you'd recommend? It, it's fairly hard to start because it's a limited market. It's a much limited market than if you're growing corn and soybeans or uh, commodity crops. Um, what to do if you were starting? Um, the difficult part is really the selling part is always more difficult than the growing part. Um, usually, salespeople are paid more than producing people in a way. So, if uh, for a young person, if you're going into business, you have to really look at the sales side of it. And if you can control and do a good job on selling, you probably be successful. So. Uh, the selling part and the relationship part of selling is probably the most important in, in not only in farming but in a lot of businesses. It's easier to, to grow corn than it is to sell corn in a sense. Uh, it's more difficult to run a grain elevator than it is to just grow corn. It, uh, so, if you can do, if you can control your sales and you can get involved in your sales, and the more you're involved in the sale, selling part of your business, probably the uh, it's more important than the producing part of the business. Many times, more profitable to you. Hmm. Um, 
And now Van, Van Drunen Farms has gone through quite a drastic change since your father's time till now. What do you see for the future of Van Drunen Farms? Uh, it should be, it looks good, I would say. Um, it's changing all the time and you have to be willing to uh, keep up with the changes. If you don't, you drop off real fast. Because the, there is a markets change all the time. So we have to adjust to that. There's things we've dropped and don't do anymore. Um, unprofitable or there's more profitable things. And there's different ways of changing. Um, the world is changing fast, particularly in our age. And if you don't keep up with the changes, you, you can lose out very, very rapidly. So there's constant changes. So you have to keep improving. And where you can improve is many, many places, many ways. That's the success of the business is going to be on how well we can keep up with changes and improvements and keep, in, keep improving products and service and quality and price, all three. Hmm. And other people are improving, so you lose out if you don't keep up with them. What about for agriculture in general? What do you see for the future of agriculture? It's very good right now, you know. <laughs> uh, ethanol has raised, in a way, all the agricultural crops. It's affecting all of it. So prices are high on most all agricultural crops, commodities. Um, probably going to continue for a while, I would say. Corn, they say, is $8 a bushel now. Uh, it, it looked like it could stay there for a while, but in the long run, it, it's probably you know, that's too high. It's going to come down. I would I would think, but when that's a different question, and maybe a while. So um, agriculture, I think, can keep up with what's needed for to produce food, but costs of agriculture have gone up, and right now there's uh, with the biofuels for use in agriculture for fuel that created a great demand and uh, it's affecting food prices and it's going to for a while. Uh, probably continue, so particularly for, I had some weather problems now in the Midwest where there's too much rain, so crops are affected somewhat. So yes, probably agriculture is gonna be better than it has been for a while. I, I would think it's uh, more going to be more profitable. Where it hadn't been very profitable for quite a while, there was an oversupply of food. Um, that's changing and it may change for a while. Hmm. It's going to take some adjustments, I think. Hmm. What about family farms? I mean, you, you're on a family farm and you're keeping a family farm alive and it's changed a few different times. What do you see about the future of family farms? Uh, they're going to become, farms are becoming bigger, and uh, that's going to continue, I think. Uh, so the family farm is going to become less. Uh, I see uh, it's efficient, you know, family farms are, are efficient, so that's why they're going to stay around. But most grain farmers are two to 3,000 acres now, and... If you don't have that, you can't hardly compete. You know, you have to almost be that large because the machinery and equipment that you can use uh, gotten bigger. So I consider it that it's going to keep becoming bigger farms and um, there's more efficiency in big farms. So it's very going to be more difficult for small farms to compete. But I don't see that as bad. Some people do, but uh, I don't think that's... Uh, Everybody's benefiting from cheaper food because of more efficiencies of bigger farms. So. Well, great. Um, I have one last question for you, and then we'll let you go since okay. you don't want to be a TV star anymore. Um, and it's a question I get to ask everybody, and that's that. This is going to be an oral history interview, and it's going to, you know, be in the Illinois State Museum as part of the archives for ever and ever and ever and ever. And one day, 
you know, maybe one of your son's grandkids might walk in right before they're taking over Van Jernigan Farms, and they might say, hey, there's Grandpa Ed, and he did an interview. And what would you like them to find in this interview? I don't know. <laughs> I would hope they would have learned something uh, from it. Um, it gives some history, uh, what's happened, which I think is important to people to know how things uh, developed and happened, how farms grow and how businesses grow. Um, so there's some things uh, hopefully they can learn. <laughs> uh, I hope they would come out of it knowing a little more about farming. Uh, it's a big part of our lives because all our food comes from farms and it's changed a lot. You know, what's happened in my lifetime has been, yeah, we've gone from uh, where most people were farmers in the country in 70 years uh, to where, well, I don't know, it's only a few percentage of the people are farmers now. I think it's only two or three percent that are people are in farming. There's a lot of people engaged in agriculture, making farm equipment and all that kind of things, and selling and marketing. But actually, people farming, I think it's only around 2%. Uh, where it was, when I was born, it was probably 80, 90% were in farming. So it's changed in my lifetime that much. And we're producing more food, better food, and everything else. With uh, so what are all the other people doing? All other kind of things. They're making cars and uh, building houses and uh, all the other benefits, TVs and all the other things that we are able to do and we have in our lifetime are because we've freed up people from just having to make, provide food, where there's a small number of people providing food now. It used to be everybody had almost be working on making food. So it, a lot of the progress in our world, in our country, and uh, today, in our, my lifetime, has changed so much more. More has changed in my lifetime in the history of the world uh, than 70 years. The last 70 years have been more changed than the whole history of the world. And that's because we've mechanized and, and, uh, and knowledge has increased and uh, we're more efficient. So where two percent of the people can provide the world with food, or in this country anyway, uh, so it's a big change. If, um, if they can get an idea of the changes that have happened, and I think the changes in the years to come are even going to be greater than that. So uh, the world is changing very rapidly, and technology is changing very rapidly. Uh, I've gone from the horse and buggy age where they farm with horses to great big tractors. And it's a whole different way of farming. Well, great. Thank you very much. Okay. I've got one, <clears throat> one follow-up question. Okay. We've interviewed uh, quite a variety of people, uh, elk ranchers and pumpkin growers and uh, beekeepers. There's a distinct odor in this building when we walked in. We haven't smelled that before in the interviews. Could you kind of describe what we're, what we're smelling in the building? Yes, we'll, we'll take you around and show you around what we have. But, you know, we're, we have all, all kind of fruits and vegetable products here, just about everything that's uh, grown. Uh, we dry or sell frozen or dry. So you're probably smelling mostly the herbs, so. Uh, it smells like a spice rack. Right. <laughs> so they, they give off more aroma than uh, most other things. So yes, you'll see. Okay. Uh, we do some garlic and onions. Uh, we store them in another building because of the, the aromas get too strong from and other products pick up the flavor of onions and garlic, so we, we store those separately. But that's uh, uh, the spices and the herbs. That's why they're used. Is, because they give off yeah. flavor and aroma.